Well, good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Bob from Mount Hall Community Church. Welcome to the Daily Manna. Today is Saturday, April the 6th, 2024. I'm with you an hour early today, and I have a, a very selfish reason why. <laughs> uh, there's actually going to be training for our security team today, and I thought I would go out and shoot with the guys so they would have enough to enough to train. So I have to be there at 9 o'clock, hence I need to start Daily Manna a little bit early. Uh, hope you guys are doing great wherever you're watching from. It is a kind of a cloudy, drizzly, rainy day here in North Idaho, but still beautiful nonetheless. And it is my honor and privilege and blessing to be with you here this morning. We're going to be starting off in Deuteronomy chapter 29, if you want to be turning there. Let's open in a word of prayer, and then I'll see who we have with us here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you and praise you for this day and for this time. Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see right now, ears to hear your still small voice. Lead us and guide us and direct us in all truth, Father. And Father, I pray for a fresh filling of your sweet Holy Spirit right here and right now. And Lord, I, say, I pray that if I say anything that is not of you, it also falls to the ground unheard. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So happy Saturday, everybody. Good to be with you once again. Let's see who we have with us. Good morning to my Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl Boone. Good to see you over there. We had kind of a rough night last night. We both woke up at like uh, 1 2 o'clock in the morning, wide awake, and we're like, are you awake? Yeah. Are you awake? Yeah. Why are we awake? We don't know, but we were both awake. I finally got up and came out, out in the living room with the dogs and started looking at stuff online and watching videos and all kinds of stuff like that. So we'll be okay. A little bit of coffee and then we'll sleep good tonight for sure. Good morning to Lori Rosick. Uh, Lori watching up here in far North Idaho says, my love and I are here. So her love would be Brian. Good morning, you guys. Doing? How are you doing, Lori? And uh, remind me again, when is your, your appointment that we've been praying for? Uh, we're looking forward to. Uh, remind me and tell us how you're doing this morning. Good morning to Virginia Graves watching from Pennsylvania. Good morning to Gil and Linda Hernandez. And, and Linda says, good morning. Just me this morning. Gil was on his way to the men's conference. Yay, yay. All right. So I just got the notification late on that, but that's a good thing. Calvary Chapel Deer Park is having their one day men's conference and Pastor Jeremy is taking over some guys. So that's really, really cool. So male bond, bonding time this morning. Good morning to Chrissy Brown and the Brown family up here in far north Idaho. Good morning to Jeannie Brown Rigsby and Lex. And Jeannie says, good morning, everyone. Lex is having surgery on Tuesday for kidney stones. Ouch. Could you please pray for him? It would be greatly appreciated. Let's pray right now and please remember to keep praying for Lex. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Lex to you. We ask that you would go before him that uh, you would calm his fears, Lord. Our, pray our prayer, of course, would be that you would heal him and take this away from him supernaturally. But if you choose to use the doctors, I pray that they would not have any problem whatsoever. And then I pray for quick recovery and quick healing to be upon our brother Lex right now. And I ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's see who else do we have in there. Uh, good morning to Ken and Cheryl Madsen watching in Grand Terrace, California. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Good morning to Howard and Alicia Pierce watching in far north Idaho. Good morning to Cheryl Schusler watching in Fort Bragg, California. Calvary Chapel, Fort Bragg is represented. Good morning to Becky Hughes watching in North Carolina. And good morning to Kim Hensley watching in Flowery Branch, Georgia. Good morning to you. Uh, I think I said this already, but good morning to Virginia Graves watching in Pennsylvania. Good morning to Kathy Leonard. Hi, Kathy. Miss you. Hope you're doing well. Good morning to you. And let's see. Good morning to Fred and Tara Zobel watching over in far north Idaho up on Smith Creek. Good morning to you guys. And good morning to Tony and Judy Meston watching in Apple Valley, California. Good morning to Don and Jana Stanford up here in north Idaho in Paradise Valley. Good morning to you. And let's see here. Did I miss anybody or are we kind of caught up for now? It looks like we are caught up. So let's dive into God's word. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Now yesterday, uh, remember the first 14 verses of our reading were blessings. 
And then we had something, golly, it was like uh, 60 verses of curses. So we have a choice, don't we? We have a blessing and a curse if we follow after God, if we, if we follow his precepts and his ways, if we love him and serve him, then it's going to be blessings. But if we turn from his ways and we do our own thing, then there's a curse. Now, this morning we continue on and we talk more about the penalties to those curses. Now, this should give everybody pause because this is a clear and set warning. Uh, there are consequences. There are problems when we do things our own way. And remember Deuteronomy. Once again, Deuteronomy is the second giving or a reminder of the law given to the children of Israel because this is the new generation about to cross over the Jordan River. And when they cross over under Joshua, this will be a type of baptism once again. The leaving of the old life, going through the water, coming up out of the other side through the water, and new life in God and in the promised land, they enter into the rest. So uh, Moses and God, actually God is speaking this, but it's through Moses. They want to make sure that uh, this is really, really clear. Uh, this is what's expected of each and every person who is called by the name Israel, Israel or governed by God. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, Horeb or Sinai, the mountain of God. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. <clears throat> your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sion king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan came out against us to battle and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, and any time you come to that word in the Bible, therefore, it causes you to look and see what is the foundation that these words are written on. That may be the previous verses in the chapter. It may be the, the previous words in the entire book. And also, we have to consider the context of the rest of the Bible. So don't forget that. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes, and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you just as he has spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God continuing, I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt and that we came through the nations which you passed through and you saw their abominations and their idols which were among them, wood and stone, silver and gold, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods, small g, of these nations and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. So Moses, again, is calling their attention, drawing their remembrance back on all the, all the people they've already fought. And when they've gone in, they've seen that these false gods have failed them. And going all the way back to Egypt, God has had passed out judgment, the one true God, on all these false gods and has prevailed. Remember, God always wants us to remember and write it down what we've experienced, how good he has been, so that we do not forget so that we know that we can count on him. Verse 19, and so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace 
even though I follow the dictates of my heart, as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. <clears throat> the Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law, so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zoboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath, all the nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heart, excuse me, what does the heat of this great anger mean? So that heat has a name. We talked about this when we were going through Revelation on Sunday morning, a hot, fiery anger. There's another word for that. It has to do with judgment. So your first question of the day, what is the word for hot, fiery judgment, righteous judgment, I might add, of God? Uh, there is a word for it. What is it? Ready, go. And good morning to Cheryl Lady, watching from Apple Valley, California. Good morning to Judy Pogvera, watching from Northern Illinois. And she says, what, early? Yes, I posted it on Facebook, on our church Facebook page. That uh, we started an hour early just this morning. Good morning to Roberta Coffey watching from Phelan, California. Good morning to Sue Robinson watching from Hayden, Idaho. Sue says, good morning, feeling much better today. The Grands say hello. Hello, Grands. Hope you're having a great Saturday. Get to hang out with Grandma. That's cool. Good morning to Ray and Nadine Sue watching in North Idaho. Good to see you. Lori says, after you all prayed the next morning, I was feeling better, praise God. The appointment is on the 25th, the 25th. Okay, so we'll have to mark that down. Thank you, Lori, for the update. I'm glad you were feeling better after that. <clears throat> Kim Hensley says, hello to all. Have a great day. You too, Kim. God bless you. And let's see here. What is the word for God's hot, hot, let's try that again, hot and fiery judgment, hot and fiery judgment. Don and Jana over on YouTube say wrath. You're absolutely right. And Don Blackney, good morning, Don, watching from Boring, Oregon. He says wrath. You're absolutely right. Lori says the wrath, wrath of God. I think that's what you meant rather than rather of God. That is correct. Nadine, you got that one right. Jeannie, you got that one right. And Virginia, you got that one right. So if you said or thought wrath, you are absolutely correct. It is the hot and fiery judgment of God. The righteous judgment is wrath. Okay, so let's see. I haven't seen Amanda yet. Uh, maybe Becky Hughes, if you want to hand out a few rewards this morning, that would be greatly appreciated. You guys are getting really good at learning up uh, the duties of other people so that we can be good uh, good stewards and good good leaders and teachers and all that. So we always train up our replacements, gang. Wrath is absolutely right. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> 25. 25? Uh -huh. Thank you, Sherry. Then people would say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods that they did not know, and that he had not given to them. Then the anger, there's that wrath again, of the Lord was aroused against this land and to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in, in wrath, in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. So as we've read, when people start to follow after these false gods, these false gods are foreign. God gives them over to the people who these false gods belong to, and they end up serving them. They serve the gods, and they serve the people. So they're no longer free, but they're back in slavery or bondage. Verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Chapter 30, verse 1, 
Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. Notice who's doing the driving here. Uh, God is already predicting ahead of time. You guys are going to walk away from me. <clears throat> You're going to turn from me. Now, there's something that my wife has said for years, and I love this. I love this quote. I'm going to quote my wife. I won't ever leave you, but you may leave me. And this is what the children of Israel do to God. God is always there. He's always there with open arms. But do they leave him? Yeah, repeatedly, over and over and over again. Matter of fact, when we're done reading with Joshua, we go right into Judges, and it's right on the heels of Joshua going to be with his fathers, going to sleep, passing away, and the people immediately fall into doing what is right in their own eyes. And Judges, of course, that takes us into the time of First and Second Samuel, and then they finally get a king. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So God is the one that drives them because, drives them into these other nations because they've turned away from the Lord. Verse 2, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his, va his voice, that's after he's driven them into these other lands, according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. So that land, Israel, it is not Palestine. It is Israel. It always has been Israel. There has never, ever been a Palestine. <clears throat> Verse 5, the Lord your God will bring you back to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So even here, just as the law has been poured out, God is not so much concerned with outward appearances, is he? He's concerned about the condition of our heart. He is for us today. He was also concerned about the circumcision of the Jewish people's heart back then. So more than putting on a show, God is more concerned about what you do when you think no one is watching. This is what we would call integrity, doing the right thing when no one is watching. And of course, somebody's always watching, aren't they? God is always watching. Thank you, Becky Hughes, for handing out rewards. And good afternoon to Samuel Mumbashi, watching from Tanzania, Africa. Hi, Samuel. And good morning to Kathy Lee Crandall, watching from Idlewild, California. I hope I didn't throw you guys off too bad. We are starting an hour early this morning. That's a um, just, just today. Monday we'll be back on track. Uh, something came up, and I have to be two places at once. And, of course, that's not possible. Okay, so let's go on. Verse 7. Also, the Lord your God will pull all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecute you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Notice that if, that is a big if, that again, that requires us to be a part of this. God gives us free will. He didn't make us mindless robots. He wants us to love him by choice and to choose to follow him. Verse 11, for this commandment, which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, this is Moses talking again. I have set before you today 
life and good, death and evil. It's a choice, isn't it? We get to choose. What do we choose? What do we do with what God has set before us? Even today, if you're watching this uh, anew for the first time and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, that choice is there for you. Do you choose to follow after Jesus? Do you choose life? Or do you think you can do what is right in your own eyes? Do it on your own. Kind of like Frank Sinatra used to sing, I did it my way. Well, guess what? My way leads right to hell. We want God's way. We want the way, the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 16, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce you to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you both and your descendants may live that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. Clinging is a lot like abiding him, abiding in him. We must put him on. He must be part of us. Cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Okay, we're going to land the plane there on the Old Testament reading this morning. And if you've joined us for the first time this morning, welcome to the One Year Bible. We call it the Daily Manna, and we call our group the Bible Gang. We meet here every morning at 8.30 a.m. Pacific. I'm an hour early this morning. But we meet on Facebook, YouTube, and on our church website located at mthallcc.com. Thank you, sweetheart. And we go line by line and word by word through the Word of God. Now, we have people watching here in North Idaho, but we also have people watching all over the country and all over the world. So if you know someone that would benefit from the One Year Bible, from reading along with us, then invite them to join us. In between our Old Testament reading and our New Testament reading, this is where we say also good morning and hello to our young people. And that's what I'm about to do right now. Let's start in California this morning. Good morning in Apple Valley to Dave and Lisa Baptist and their daughters, Laney, Freya, and Kennedy. Good morning to Ken and Cheryl Madsen in Grand Terrace, California, and their granddaughter, Aubrey. Good morning to Terry Lockwood and her daughters, Hannah and Rachel. Good morning to Letitia Jordan and her kids, uh, Elisha and Isaiah. Good morning to Crystal Reese and her kids, Caleb, Elijah, and Savannah. Good morning to Ernie and Amanda Joy Custodio and their kids, Jason, Lala, and Lexi. Good morning to Andrew and Jackie and their kids, Karis, Judah, Titus, and Malachi. Good morning to Richard and Maureen Maxwell on the road on vacation in Florida. And their kids, Chad and Kristen, Dakota and Sierra, and grandkids, Ashlyn, Rose, and Jackson. Thank you, honey. Appreciate you doing that. Good morning to Cheryl Lady and her grandson, Jax. Good morning to Tony and Judy Meston and their grandkids, Liam, Kylie, Shelby, Peyton, Samuel, and let's see, no, I've already put Freya and Kennedy up there with the Baptists. Okay, they're with the Baptists. I have to redo my list again, sorry. Good morning to Sandra Backsky and her kids, Grace, Hope, Ezekiel, and Mercy. Good morning to Sarah Suters, Reinschild, and her kids, Nathan Tucker and Easton. Good morning to Jessica and Lake Ovaher, watching in Livermore, California, and their son, Brody. Good morning to Mike and Judy Pogvera in Northern Illinois and their grandkids, Bowen, Wyatt, and Honora. Good morning to Kim Hensley in Flowery Branch, Georgia and her grandkids, John, Jake, Deacon, Briley, and Ellie. And in far north Idaho, because I almost dropped a page, bear with me. Good morning to Sue Robinson, and she's got the grandkids with her this morning, watching from Hayden. Good morning to Kinsley, Macy, Emmy, and Deacon. Hi, guys. In Bonners Ferry, good morning to Nicole Espino and her kids, Jediah, Aiden, and Mabel. Good morning to Ron and Christy Campbell and their kids, Melanie and Joe. Good morning to CJ and Erica McVeigh and their kids, Ellie and Bjorn. Good morning to Eric and Linda Letterhaus and their granddaughter, Brinley.
Good morning to Eric and Lucille Spindler and their kids Richter and Tsunami. Good morning to Brian and Chrissy Brown and their kids Olivia, Vivian, and Elijah. Good morning to John and Jenna Hardman and their kids Evie, Josiah, and Samuel. Good morning to Brandon and Alicia Shaver and their kids Samuel, Victoria, and Matthew. Good morning to Randy and Lainey Ralph up on Katka Ridge and their grandkids Luke and Noah. Good morning to Frank and Diane Hankey in Sandpoint and their grandson Boomerang. Good morning to Dave and Stephanie Wood and their kids Hunter, Ryder, and Flynn. Good morning to Cody and Shauna Dawn, the writers, and their kids Gavin and Kennedy. Good morning to Sarah Falk and their daughter Addie. Good morning to Bob and Tatiana Hargrove and their daughters Victoria and Emily. Good morning to Renee Moore and her daughter Mallory in South Carolina. And last but not least in in uh, Alpine, Wyoming, good morning to Heidi and Aaron Kendall and their kids, Carson and Nora. Top of the day to all of you. I hope you're having a great day. Chrissy says, I tell my kids every day is a choice, but you can't serve both masters. Absolutely right. Good advice. Good morning to Nancy Ackley. Hi, Nancy. Nice to have you with us. And good morning to Bob and Karen Eddy. I see you guys in there watching from far north Idaho. Okay, we continue on. We're in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And we pick up at verse 37. <clears throat> and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him, Jesus, to dine with him. So when he went in and he sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he did not first, he had not first washed before dinner. Now, there's no evidence that the, that the Pharisee said a thing here. And it's very, very clear that Jesus, again, is reading his mind and perceives what he's thinking. This is not the first time that Jesus has done this. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Now Jesus says this because God's law, the old Levitical law, says nothing about this washing process. So you know the marriage feast at Cana, all those big buckets of water that Jesus turned into wine? Those were for the ceremonial washing. And people would have to go through this washing process. And as I said, it wasn't in the word of God, but the Pharisees and the religious leaders thought, well, if this is what God's standard is, let's make it a little bit more holy. Let's add to it. And it didn't become, it didn't remain the law of God, but it became a tradition or the law of man, which is not a good thing. So trying to force people to, uh, or pile on and give them more things to do, Jesus is about to rebuke them. So let's go on. The Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather give alms of such things as you have, and indeed all things are clean to you. Okay, your next question of the day, Bible gang, is what is an alm? What is an alm? What, what would that incorporate? There's a number of different things an alm can be. Alms for the poor, what does that mean? Ready, go. And there's Heidi Jo Kendall in Alpine, Wyoming. Hi, Heidi. Good to see you in there. What is an alm? Verse 42. But woe to you, Pharisees. Now, woe is oy vey. <laughs> One day I looked this up, what, what woe was. And uh, unbeknownst to me, my wife had been saying this for years. She'd been saying, oy vey, oy vey, anytime she got frustrated. And it turned out she had picked that up from her grandmother when she was a little girl. Her grandmother would say that. And her grandmother's mother was an immigrant from Eastern Europe, the Lithuanian Poland area right in there. And uh, there's a possibility that Sherry's grandma may have come from a Jewish background. So woe or horror is the Jewish word oy vey. And it means like a lass or not a very good thing. It is not a very good thing at all. Woe to you means bad things are happening. Bad things are happening. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by judgment and the love of God. 
Now, no, notice here, Jesus goes on and says, these ought you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So here we see a principle where the Pharisees are tithing. They're being legalistic on their tithing right down to spices. And Jesus doesn't do away with tithing. He says, you should have continued to do that, but not neglected love and justice. You should have continued doing the tithing, but not neglected love and justice. The reason I bring that out is there are some today that will try and tell you that tithing, oh, there's that runaway dog. I saw him. There he goes. So uh, there's a big white, it almost looks like a, not a husky, but there's a mal malamoy or something like that, like a snow dog. And he is a runaway from Second Chance Animal Shelter. He actually got out of there. And we've been seeing him run around the neighborhood. He just popped out of our yard. And he's going into the neighbor's yard now. Anyway, sorry about that. So the principle here is that tithing continues. That is a New Testament principle. It's not just an Old Testament principle. So when somebody tells you, oh, no, you don't have to tithe anymore. That comes from the Old Testament. Not necessarily true, because otherwise Jesus would have said, okay, that's Old Testament only, but he doesn't do that. He said, you should have continued doing this without forsaking love and justice. Okay, let's go on. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Okay, I'm going to stop right there at verse 45 for a second and look at what your answers are. What is an alm? What is an alm? Don and Janice say, Don says charitable contribution. Uh, that is a very generalized term, but that, that is technically correct, Don. I'll explain in a minute. Let's see what else you guys are saying. Nadine says, mercy and kindness, kind deeds. That's a good guess, but not quite there, Nadine. Lori says, gifts to the poor. That's good. That's it. Uh, Roberta Coffey says, charity to the poor. And uh, that's also correct. Becky Hughes says, helping the poor. Uh, Virginia Graves says, gifts. Chrissy Brown breaks it down a little bit more. Money or food given to the poor. Good job. Uh, Judy Pogvera says, charity for needy, above and beyond our tithes and offerings. And it is charity for the needy. It actually, the alms for the poor have nothing to do with our tithes and offerings. So that would be correct. It's whatever you choose to do when you see a poor, poor, poor person. Uh, Linda Hernandez says, donations. That is also correct. So here's the thing. This is what an alm is. Can it be food? Yes. Can it be money? Yes. It can be silver, it can be gold, it can be jewelry, it can be clothing, it can be a blanket. All of these are examples of alms. Taking care of somebody who is destitute and helping them out. That is an alm. That is the over overarching, uh, I guess, banner that you would say for an alm. So if you're saying charity, yeah, it is charity, but it, it incorporates a lot of different things. So I want to be clear. So sometimes somebody might not have money to give. Or let's say you, you're uh, responding to somebody who's a street person, a homeless person, and you're afraid to give them money, but maybe you go down to McDonald's and you buy a uh, value meal and you give that to them. That would be an example of an alm. That way they can't use the money and buy drugs or alcohol. That would be considered an alm. Or you have a spare blanket that you keep in your car and you hand that to them. That would also be an alm. Maybe an extra coat or... A uh, sweatshirt, something like that. Also an alm. Thank you, Becky Hughes. She's already on it on the rewards. So hope that makes sense. Lori says gifts to the poor. That is absolutely right. I'm not sure if I acknowledged that before. So that's what an alm is. Good job. Let's go on. Verse 45. Verse 45. Then one of the lawyers. Now the lawyers, again, this is in biblical terms. This, this is a Levite. This is somebody who would write and copy scrolls down, books of the Bible, if you will. It all had to be done by hand. They would be experts in the law, hence the title lawyer, but typically a Levite. They are not a priest. A priest is a Kohen, and that would be from the, the line of Aaron, that from that sub-tribe, if you will. So uh, uh, a lawyer, and lawyers and scribes often get kind of written in there together. 
Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. You've insulted us, Jesus. Is Jesus a respecter of persons? No. You see people all the time, and you'll see, see in our world today, oh, Jesus loved everybody. When you actually read the Bible for yourself, you see that Jesus was not weak. Jesus was meek, strength under control. So he confronts this man too. Is he afraid of insulting somebody? No, he's not, especially when it's due and they need to be insulted or woke up. And he yeah, said yeah, to them, he does, love us. he does that because he does love us, yeah. as Cher said. Yeah, sometimes he spanks us, doesn't he? So in this particular case, we do see in the Bible where Pharisees, they do come to a saving knowledge of Christ. A good example is uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Also, Nicodemus became Christ followers. So not all of these religious leaders, even though they started off terrible, some of them became Christ followers. An example of a Levite that became a Christ follower, Barnabas, whose, whose name was Joseph, also a Levite, and became a Christ follower. So sometimes they need to have uh, they need to have Jesus get right in their face. And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear. You give them all these rules and regulations they have to follow, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So it's kind of a do as I say, not as I do type thing. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. Okay, I'm going to continue on in just a second here, but a lot of these Pharisees and, and Sadducees and lawyers and scribes, they would honor the prophets. They would say they believed in the prophets, and it was their forefathers that put them to death. And they're doing the same things as their forefathers were doing. That's the point that Jesus is saying. You haven't learned a thing. You're doing the same exact things. Verse 51, from the blood of Abel, all the way back in Genesis, to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Now, this is not Zechariah the prophet, but this is Zechariah the son of Jehoiada the high priest. Jehoiada the high priest who saved little baby Joash from Queen Athaliah. Remember that? Queen Athaliah in the Old Testament. Uh, she made herself queen. She replaced all things God with all things Baal and Asherah. And Jehoiada hid the last remaining remnant or the last remaining descendant of King David uh, as a baby and waited until he was seven years old. And then he gathered all the temple guards together. And on a, an appointed day, he said, now. And he rose up against Athaliah, had her killed and installed Joash. Now, Joash, he was a godly king and a good man all the days that Jehoiada lived. But when Jehoiada passed away, Joash started to listen to ungodly counsel, and he actually had Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, killed between the altar and the temple there. So this is that Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourself, and those who were entering in you hindered. So talking about, we talked about this before, uh, your shepherds, your prostitutes who want to repent and cover their sins and, and come in and offer a sacrifice and, and turn over a new leaf. They wouldn't let them in. The publicans who were considered traitors, they wouldn't let them in. They have the words of knowledge, the words of life that God had given them in the law. They don't follow it themselves and they impede others from coming to God. This is who he's talking to. Verse 53, and as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. I, all the time, this is what they did. That takes us to chapter 12, verse 1. Good morning to Annette Fulton, watching up here in far north Idaho. Hi, Annette, good to see you. Hope you and Tim are doing well. Okay, we're continuing on in Luke 
chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven, again, it's a type of sin. It puffs up. It's a bacteria. It corrupts. It's hypocrisy. A hypocrisy, it means actor, but it's more than that. In, back in that day, an actor was not someone like a Hollywood type today. They were the lowest of the low. They were itinerant. They, they traveled from town to town. And when they were acting, they would hold up like a masquerade mask to cover their face as they played the different roles. Now, the picture here of a, of a hypocrite is not just someone who is an actor, but the message here is that they are two-faced. You can't trust them. So avoid the leaven of the Pharisees because they're two-faced. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you've spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. So there's nothing secret, is there? It's just like Jesus perceiving the thoughts of the Pharisee. He thought he was thinking to himself, but Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking. So all will be revealed, gang. Verse 4, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have, there is no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him, that's God, who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So don't be afraid of man. Don't be afraid of the multitude. Don't be afraid of what they can say that they are going to do to you in this evil world, but have a healthy, strong fear of God instead, because he holds the keys, not just to hell, but also to heaven. And that's where we're going. So don't be afraid of this evil world, gang. Keep following after the Lord. And remember, if you're following after the Lord, that fear is a healthy, loving reverence. If you're not following after the Lord, you should be in fear of being wiped out because very soon that's what's going to happen to all of us. Not being wiped out, but we're going to have to stand before a righteous God in hot, fiery wrath. And the only thing that will save us is what have we done with his son, Jesus? Amen. Turn back in your Bibles again to the Old Testament. Psalm 78. Psalm chapter 78, if you would, please. This is a contemplation of Asaph, and I believe it is called a mashkill. Some of your Bibles may say a mashkill. That again, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's thought to be a musical term. Something again to do with song, because again, all of these Psalms of the Bible are actually songs, and many of them are the basis for worship songs that we have today. Verse 1, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that he should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may rise, arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation." a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Now this takes place after, by the way, after the uh, split between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. This was where... Uh, the king of Judah had actually hired bowmen from the, uh, the tribe of Ephraim to come down and fight for them. And um, this was during the time that the northern kingdom was not following after God. 
And so they were turned back. And what did they end up doing? They went back and they raided against Judah. They raided and they killed, robbed, and destroyed. Marvelous things, verse 12, he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Now, it wasn't just that they asked for the food. Remember, they wanted meat. It's when God gave the meat, they never even said thank you. So that was followed with a plague, wasn't it? Good morning to Renee Zimmerman watching from Beaumont, California. Hi, Renee. Nice to see you in there. Chrissy Brown says, I love that verse. I'm glad. I like it too. Good morning to Rob and Jojo Murray, also watching in far north Idaho. Good morning to you guys. Verse 21. Therefore, the people heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Now you see here, Jacob and Israel are named almost in the same sentence. Actually, uh, it is the same sentence, so it's a run-on sentence. And when you see this in the Bible, usually you'll see this in the Old Testament, Jacob is what Israel was called before God gave him a new heart. And this is after he wrestles with a Christophany, Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament. And God tells Jacob, Jacob meaning deceiver, supplanter, heel snatcher, you'll be called Jacob no more. Your new name will be Israel, one who wrestled with God and prevailed. But it also means one who is governed by God. So oftentimes you'll see when uh, people in the Bible, they're not walking with the Lord, they'll be called by their given name like uh, Peter would be called Simon, son of Jonah. But when they're walking with the Lord, Peter might be called Peter or Cephas, the name that the Lord gave him. In this case, you see you you see the supplanter, the deceiver, but you also see Israel or governed by God. Verse 22, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation, yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He had rained down manna on them to eat and given them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. And I hope that's what daily manna is to you guys. This is angels' food, the very word of God that we're reading right now. Manna, again, the bread from heaven, it means what is it? What is it? Because they didn't know exactly what it was. It was kind of sweet, had a kind of a honey-like taste. And coriander, they could grind it up and make bread out of it. But it wasn't a traditional bread. It was more like a donut, you might say. He sent them food to the full. Verse 26, he caused an east wind to blow in the heavens. And by his power, he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. So they ate and they were filled for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. Again, we need to remember, these people were whining, they were complaining, they were backbiting against God, and when he gave them the desire of their heart, they still never said thank you. So when we pray to something about something to God, and he answers our prayer. The very next time we pray, that should be the first thing on our lips. Lord, thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness. The glory belongs to you, Father. Yvonne Jett says, I must have missed the memo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Yvonne. So last night I posted it on our church Facebook page that we were starting at 7.30 this morning. My apologies, a schedule conflict. We will be back at regular time on Monday. All right, we're in Proverbs chapter 12, everybody. Proverbs chapter 12. Also, good morning to Elvira Gutierrez, watching from Apple Valley, California. So Proverbs 12, we have verses 19 and 20. I'm going to start first in the New King James Version. And then this morning, why don't we do the New American Standard Version? And uh, we'll, we'll peruse it through that. 
Proverbs 12, verse 19. The truthful lips shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. Okay, let's look at this now through Proverbs, Proverbs 12, 19, and 20, and we'll look at it through the New American Standard Version. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. So be a counselor of peace, everybody. Walk with the Lord. Serve Him. My apologies to you once again for those that are just joining us. Um, sometimes I have these things come up. I try to get the word out. Make sure that if you're not already, that you're following Mount Hall and all of its... Uh, all of its doings so that when there's a post, you get notified of that. I try to post it ahead of time so that you're aware of it. Uh, I, I try to keep this pretty much on schedule. We're at 830, but there is, there are things that pop up that I have to be two places at once. And so, of course, that's not possible. So my apologies if I threw anybody off. We will be back at our regular time on Monday morning. So welcome to the weekend, everybody. Everybody have a wonderful day. I'm going to close in prayer right now. Remember, uh, Mount Hall Community Church, we have two services tomorrow. We're back in our regular schedule. Early service is at 8.30 a.m. Pacific, followed by our late service at 10.30 a.m. Pacific. The 10.30 a.m. service will also have children's church as well as live streaming. And tomorrow is Communion Sunday and also Potluck Sunday. So we're looking forward to a wonderful time in Christ together. So come on out. And if you you don't have a church home, consider Mount Hall Community Church. Or if you're watching from outside the area, again, have a watch party and watch our live stream. So let's close in a word of prayer right now and start our day. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you and praise you for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. And Father, I lift up uh, Natasha to you for her upcoming uh, surgery. I pray that you would go before her, that you would touch her, that you would completely heal her. Be with her husband, Granite. Lord, minister to him as well. I pray for Lori and her upcoming appointment on the 25th. I ask that you would give her doctor wisdom. I pray right now for strength for the day, for your healing touch to be upon her, that you would supernaturally touch and heal her, that you would be with her, strengthen her, that you would also be with her husband, Brian, Lord, minister to him and bless him as he takes care of his bride. I pray for Jeff and Tia, Lord. I pray again for uh, this appointment that he had yesterday. I pray that the news is good and that they're able to operate on that mass and use the cyber knife and uh, that he doesn't have to have chemo or radiation or anything like that. And I pray for your complete healing on him. I pray also for Tia and himself, Lord, that you would strengthen them, help them to finish their house as well. I pray for Sabi in Southern California for healing over cirrhosis of the liver. I pray for baby Carter in Washington State that you would touch and heal this little girl completely and that you would cause her mom and dad to come to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray for Don Mason for salvation of his soul, also healing of his cancer. I pray for Jojo Murray for healing over her lung cancer. Be with her and be with her husband Rob. Strengthen and bless them. I pray for Melody Smith in Apple Valley for healing over her migraine headaches. I pray for Mary in Southern California for healing of her uh, breast cancer, also restoration of her vision. I pray for Don Stanford, Lord. I pray for complete healing on him, that you would give the doctors wisdom on dealing with autoimmune diseases, that you would prepare him for his knee replacement surgery, that you would bless and touch every part of him and bring him back to complete health. And I pray also for his bride, for Jana, that you would strengthen and touch, encourage and bless her. I pray for Frank for healing over his diabetic wound. I pray for Gary and Kimberly and Angels Camp that you would give them strength and wisdom as they lead their family. And I pray for little Caleb and Casey and Riley that you would heal, heal them completely of their deshanes. Extend their life, Lord. We need a miracle here. Bless them, I pray. I pray for Michaela and Danielle that you would draw them back into fellowship and that you would restore their faith in you. I pray for Yvonne Jett for healing of her lung cancer, or excuse me, not lung cancer, I beg your pardon, for healing of her lungs. I get so caught up in cancer all the time, sometimes I just go right into it. My apologies, Yvonne. 
I pray for complete healing on her lungs, that she would no longer need that oxygen tank, that you would bless her and restore her health. I pray for our brother Hans Vanderveen, Lord, for comfort and strength and blessing on him. I pray for Kevin and the Aaron Green, Lord. I pray that you would bless them and comfort them and strengthen them. I pray also for their kids, Amy and Tyler, Lord, that you would wipe every tear from their eye, that you would strengthen and encourage them as well. And Father, we give you our lives today as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service, Lord. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem and that you would defend your nation, Zion. I pray that the world would not fall out of control and that there would be no further conflict or escalation of hostilities. I pray that you would bless our president and our vice president, that you would draw them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, give them wisdom, and that there would be a future and a hope for our country. And Father, we just thank you and praise you that you're such a good God. We cry out, Maranatha, come get us, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. We thank you and praise you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Cheryl and I love you. Have a great day, and we will see you Monday here on the Daily Manna. Bye-bye. Love you. Guys. Love you.